February 3rd. Every day of the year has some sort of history attached to it, yet few other dates have the long-lasting and unforgettable events forever linked to them that lurk about the 3rd. On the 34th day of 1690, the American economy would take a bounding leap forward when the colony of Massachusetts issued the first paper money in the Western Hemisphere. The same day in 1870, the United States would take the first step in developing an equal and unoppressive nation with the ratification of the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution, guaranteeing voting rights to men regardless of race. As with most dates, the history of February 3rd is not exclusively positive. In fact, the most well-known February 3rd in history is known for a much more tragic reason. On Tuesday, February 3rd, 1959, the world music scene was shaken to its very core. It is now termed the day the music died because of the profound impact it had not only on the fans of music, but on other artists as well. Richie Valens, singer of La Bamba and Come Let's Go, JP, the big bopper Richardson, known especially for the song Chantilly Lace, and Buddy Holly, a rising star responsible for That'll Be the Day and Peggy Sue, all would have their lives and careers cut short in a plane crash shortly after takeoff near Clear Lake, Iowa. That was my pal Glasses and I'm the Glider. Thanks for tuning in to Frames and Fame. Broadcasting from the Buddy Holly Center, this is episode 3, The Last Tour. This is our third and hopefully a long series of podcasts that will deal largely with Buddy Holly, early rock and roll, and the collection at our museum located at 1801 Crickets Avenue in Lubbock, Texas. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to check out our sister podcast, Wings of War, which focuses on World War II, the American Military Glider Program, and the collections at the Silent Wings Museum. By early 1959, a lot had changed for Buddy Holly. At this point in his career, he was internationally known, thanks to his tours in the U.S., Australia, and the U.K. He had married Maria Elena Santiago, ended his business relationship with Norman Petty, and disbanded the original Crickets band. Without an acting manager and a backup band, Buddy began to focus more on his career as a solo artist. Buddy was on the top of the rock and roll music scene, but he wanted more. Never content with being put into the confines of a single music genre, Buddy began to experiment with other musical influences, such as classical and Spanish rhythms. This led some people to believe that he was leaving rock and roll altogether. While this claim cannot be validated one way or the other, it was more than likely just Buddy being Buddy and wanting to better himself as a musician. The rock and roll music scene was changing along with Buddy Holly. As mentioned in the previous episode, at the start of Holly's career, economic stability and the disposable income of America's youth allowed the budding rock and roll genre to flourish. However, due to a national economic recession, that was sadly no longer the case. Since the commercial success of That'll Be the Day, Buddy Holly seemed to have no trouble getting gigs. Strangely enough, though, there was an apparent lack of publicity to keep Buddy on top of the charts. Now on his own, professionally, Buddy, with the help of Maria Elena, started being more proactive in engaging with his fans. Together, the couple started to answer fan mail, create newsletters, and organize fan clubs from their New York apartment. When the General Artists Corporation came to Buddy in early 1959 regarding a 24-day American tour, he agreed. However, this put Buddy into a bit of a predicament. With the original crickets disbanded, Buddy was forced to find musicians to back him up on stage. This new band consisted of Tommy Alsop on guitar, Carl Bunch on drums, and Waylon Jennings as the bassist. For reasons which today are still unknown, this new band was also billed as the crickets. The stage was now set for what would be Buddy Holly's last tour. Sometimes dubbed the worst planned tour in history, the Winter Dance Party was scheduled for January 23rd through February 15th, 1959. This tour went through the heart of the American Midwest, with most of the shows in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa. Unlike the previous tours that Buddy Holly had done with the GAC, the Winter Dance Party was very small and only consisted of five acts. Holly, Richie Valens, 
The Big Bopper, Dion and the Belmonts, and Frankie Sardo. While the crowds were very warm and inviting, the Midwest winter weather gave these musicians a very cold reception. Opening night for the tour was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and the temperature was negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 31 degrees Celsius. To make matters worse, Buddy Holly and the rest of the musicians were chartered from show to show by bus. These buses were poorly heated and were prone to break down. On the first week of the tour, the performers had to switch means of transportation several times. Carl Bunch, the drummer for Buddy on the tour, actually suffered from frostbite on his feet while sitting on one of the broken down buses. On February 2nd, 1959, the troupe of musicians reached Clear Lake, Iowa and performed at the Surf Ballroom. Though the group arrived later than scheduled, the show still went on, on time. Admission to the show was $1.25, or roughly $11 in today's economy, and was advertised as a four-hour show. Over 1,500 patrons attended the show, which lasted from 8 p.m. till midnight. Tired of traveling in such terrible conditions and wanting to get some much-needed rest before the next show, Buddy Holly approached the manager of the surf ballroom after the show and asked him to arrange a small charter plane for himself, Waylon Jennings, and Tommy Alsep. Carl Bunch was still in the hospital and was not at the performance. However, the passenger list would change with the exception of Buddy Holly. The Big Bopper had been sick and asked Waylon Jennings if he could please have his seat on the plane, so in exchange for a new sleeping bag, Waylon agreed. As for Tommy Alsup, it came down to chance and a flip of a coin. After the show, Richie Valens was signing autographs and happened to run into Alsup, who was doing a last sweep to make sure he hadn't forgotten anything. It was then that Valens asked if he could ride on the plane instead. Alsup decided to flip a coin and said if Valens called it correctly, he could have the final spot on the plane. As fate would have it, Valens called heads, and it was. Shortly after 1 a.m. on February 3rd, the same charter plane took off with Valens and the Big Bopper in the back and Buddy Holly up front with the pilot, Roger Peterson. Sadly, it would never reach its destination of Moorhead, Minnesota. The plane went down shortly after takeoff, but the wreckage was not discovered until 9.30 a.m. There were no survivors. In true Buddy Holly fashion, the scheduled tour did go on even in the absence of three of their headliners. There are many what-ifs when it comes to the untimely death of Buddy Holly. Originally, the surf ballroom was not on the tour itinerary. Early schedules show no performances between the Green Bay show on February 1st and the Moorhead show scheduled for the 3rd. The late edition of the show added extra stress, travel, and time restrictions to the already difficult tour arrangement. However, the welcoming Buddy Holly received at the surf ballroom demonstrated just how popular he was with America's youth, even without the original crickets backing him. What would have happened to Buddy Holly if he had not died is a question that many fans, historians, and music critics have asked over the years. While no one can resolve this question in its entirety, there are some planned projects of Buddy's that are known. Buddy had become involved in so many aspects of the music industry, it is fairly clear that Buddy wanted to not only expand his range of musical influences, but he also wanted to see what it was like on the other side of the glass as a producer. There are architectural drawings that show a house Buddy was planning to build with a studio attached to it. There was also talk of him starting his own publishing company to help promote him and his colleagues' songs. This way, aspiring artists would have a place to go and be given the artistic freedom that he had managed to obtain. Even though there is no way of knowing how these ambitions would have played out, it suggests that Buddy Holly died at the beginning of his career, not at his peak. Buddy's songs continued to be released well into the 1960s due to unissued recordings and various compilations of his work. New groups started to cover some of Holly's older songs to varying degrees of success, most notably a wet-behind-the-ears group known as the Rolling Stones when they covered Not Fade Away in 1964 for their first top 10 hit. The Beatles, taking influence from the Crickets, also used an insect for their name. They were so enamored with Buddy that when playing on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1964, the first thing that John Lennon asked was, is that the stage Buddy Holly played on? 
Both the Rolling Stones and the Beatles used the sound that Buddy Holly and the Crickets created to power their first few albums before becoming the musical innovators and icons that we know them as today. Waylon Jennings launched his career after getting his first big break playing bass for Buddy Holly during his final tour. His music was heavily influenced by the late Lubbock star and was apparent throughout his career. The tragedy even inspired a song that laments Buddy's death as the day the music died because of the influential and artistic loss that was suffered in that plane crash. Ironically, the song American Pie by Don McLean served to cement the legacy of Buddy Holly. Buddy Holly's premature death sparked a number of foundations that were created in his honor, most notably the Buddy Holly Educational Foundation. This group's mission statement is focused on spreading the joy of musical education to the new generation, regardless of learning levels, ethnicity, or income. They offer scholarships, workshops, and retreats for aspiring young musicians in order to hone their skills. Their impact is felt far and wide throughout the musical community and the world as they work to further the goals that Buddy Holly and his wife Maria Elena dreamed of so many years ago. Lubbock never forgot their native son, creating the Buddy Holly Center where we tell the story of Buddy's life and music career. Clear Lake Iowa memorialized the surf ballroom, creating the landmark that stands as the final venue that Buddy Holly performed at. Thousands travel to these locations every year to learn about and pay their respects to the young man who was taken too soon from the rock and roll world and music fans everywhere. Buddy Holly's influence continues to be felt to this day by musicians and fans alike, both old and new. The truth of the matter is, Buddy's legacy will live on in the hearts of his fans and those he inspired, making sure his music will never die. <laughs> 